Right. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Sagatri Kaluru, Manager Emerging Technologies at Digital Supply Chain Institute. I'm thrilled to welcome you all to this session. For those of you who are new to DSCI and the Women Leading Digital Supply Chain Transformations Initiative, uh, this is all about advancing and transforming future of women leadership in supply chains. And through events like this, we aim to bring forward women leaders to share their success stories and experiences. For this session, we have Julie Hamilton, who is the Global Chief Commercial Officer at Diageo. Diageo is a British multinational beverage alcohol company with its headquarters in London, England. It operates in more than 180 countries and 140 sites. Julie, it's a pleasure to have you and thank you very much for joining us. It's great to be here. I'm really looking forward to the session and thanks so much for inviting me and having me and uh, Look forward to uh, hopefully a uh, good interactive uh, session uh, where it's not just me talking and then it will truly be a fireside chat. Awesome. Quick notes on housekeeping. The duration of the session is 30 minutes. Thank you very much for all of you who sent your questions beforehand. We will have the chat activated. Uh, as Julie mentioned, we want to make this chat interactive. So please comment on anything you find interesting and please feel free to type your questions in as well and we will try to fit them in. Right, let's get started. So Julie, um, you've been a champion of women in business and a prominent leader in the global drinks industry. Can you give us a brief summary of your 20 plus uh, years of career path and your current role at Diageo? Great, uh, happy to. So um, I am currently the global chief commercial officer at Diageo. Uh, in that role, I have responsibility for the uh, corporate function of global sales and commercial. That encompasses everything from uh, really what we call our growth initiatives, uh, which is uh, all about revenue growth management to how we execute, how we work with customers uh, and how we innovate uh, to create a commercial advantage in the market. Uh, we have about 6,000 um, associates uh, across all of our markets that are part of our sales function. Uh, so it is a very uh, interconnected group, uh, but very uh, diverse and geographic, uh, geographically spread pretty wide. Uh, prior to joining Diageo, I joined about 18 months ago. So I got uh, about eight months uh, pre-pandemic, uh, which was a, a great opportunity. Uh, I'm really glad now that I spent a lot of that time traveling and getting out to markets because who knew it would actually shut down for the last year. Uh, but uh, it's been a really great experience. Um, we have launched a, a five-year transformation strategy. Uh, our overall purpose uh, and vision for the company is to be the best performing, most respected CPG company. And uh, so we recognize that uh, we cannot be that unless we have a commercial advantage and we must be uh, excellent in, in all areas of commercial. So really been focused on driving that transformation across uh, our markets. Uh, before being at Diageo, I, uh, was, um, I spent 23 years at Coca-Cola. Uh, most recently at Coca-Cola, I was the global chief customer and commercial leadership officer. Uh, a very similar role to what I'm doing at Diageo, but uh, probably a little bit more focused on customers. Uh, because of Coca-Cola's uh, broad portfolio with uh, quick serve restaurants, et cetera. Um, and uh, grew up really in the Coca-Cola system uh, in sales and marketing and customer management, led our global Walmart business uh, and um, really had the opportunity to uh, travel and visit more uh, than a hundred different countries. And uh, that was also a great experience, but I was really intrigued uh, by Diageo. It's a great company, a great brand portfolio, some of which you see behind me, and uh, the challenge of really driving that transformation. Uh, did spend a little bit of time uh, on the uh, ad agency side uh, and at Anheuser-Busch before joining um, Coca-Cola. So I like to think that uh, I have a really wide uh, range of beverage experience. So everything from house spirits uh, to beer and to sparkling uh, non-carbonated drinks. So I've, I've got that all covered. It's amazing. What an amazing career. Thank you for sharing that, Julie. Um, so the Digital Supply Chain Institute um, we're working for is, is all about emphasizing and researching the importance of supply chains to a successful business and how supply chains can lead the transformation of business models, especially in today's world. Um, can you offer a few of your 
impressions of supply chains from your career, both good and bad. And that is, where do they make a positive difference and where do you think they can hold an organization or a company or a division back? Great. Uh, what I would say is, um, for me in particular, uh, one of the key things we're finding is that we have to break down the silos um, and that working and being successful today requires much more of the ability to work cross-functionally. So even if you asked 18 months ago, when I first started in this role, how much of an interaction I had with supply chain, I'd say, well, I, I, know, my, I know my point people uh, and I understand how it fits in and I, I understand where I need to do the strategic work about our route to market and our route to consumer. Um, but the nitty gritty of supply chain, I didn't spend a lot of time on. And particularly uh, with the pandemic, um, it's really forced us to collapse those barriers between the two and be much more integrated. And I think that uh, those, those actions that we've taken uh, to get much closer uh, to uh, have shared objectives, shared visibility, um, both good and bad, because uh, let's face it, sometimes in supply chain, you wanna, you wanna put the positive on it, it's coming, the product's gonna get there. Uh, but we've really worked on um, having much better transparency, much better linkage. So really taking an end-to-end -end approach um, that is regardless of what function you're in, it's recognized to be seamless. So uh, I think you're gonna see more and more of that. So I know we'll probably get into a little bit about the digitization um, of the supply chain and, and the work that we're doing there. Um, but I think that it has all started with the fact that no longer can supply chain be a standalone kind of siloed function. Um, it has to interact not only with commercial, but we're getting much, supply chains working much closer with marketing um, on how, how will we supply product? What are the right products? What are the right uh, supply lines? Um, and then also to our sustainability uh, and um, our sustainability goals. And it's really, really critical. Um, so you really see supply chain becoming um, not a standalone entity, which in our case, since we, we distill a lot of products and they, they age and we have huge uh, production in, in that side and, and um, to being much more integrated into the day-to-day -day of the business. I'm glad you mentioned uh, cross-functional collaboration and shared objectives, really, uh, because, you know, all through our works at DSCI, one thing especially we have, we've been observing uh, is uh, when we launch whether any product, uh, project related to digital supply chains, these are the key elements for the success of the project. It, it doesn't matter whether which team you're in, you know, the shared objective is the key driving factor which enables you to experiment and digitize your supply chains. And looking forward to hear more of your stories at DIG from that element. All right, uh, so let's talk a little bit about the topic of this hour, women in supply chains. Um, Julie, I'm... I'm um, in fact, you know, you mentioned that you've traveled to 100 countries and uh, that's amazing. I personally love travel and, you know, I was jealous for a moment over there. Um, but the supply chains have historically been a position filled mostly by men. Um, do you believe that is still the case or have you seen a changing from your experience traveling to different countries? So what advice do you have for organizations to address this gap and promote women leadership in supply chains? Yes. So I would say as, um, I think first of all, we're seeing really great progress and I'll share you a couple of anecdotes about that. But uh, I think, you know, supply chains have moved from being much more production focused uh, and shipment focused to being much more strategic and an integral piece of the business. And that lends itself to people with uh, more diverse skills and it requires, uh, um, I think a broad range of expertise and that, I believe is helping recruit um, women into supply chain because it doesn't feel very, you know, production centric or shipment centric. Um, there's much more science and technology and collaboration and customer focus uh, that goes into it. Um, and I think that that's really, uh, you know, and the, the cross-functional connections are really helping broaden the appeal of the traditional supply chain career to people. Um, now, my couple anecdotes, uh, very interestingly, at Diageo, um, we've, uh, the, my primary contacts that I work with in supply chain, and I do have a supply chain person in my team, but on the real supply chain function side, um, are both women. Uh, and uh, it's kind of unique um, to sit in a supply chain meeting and, and have more than, you know, half of the room be female. Uh, 
Uh, and I think um, Giaggio has made a purpose, purposeful choice to try to recruit uh, that both gender um, and um, just diversity in general. And finding women uh, who uh, can bring in those skill sets and then really assigning them uh, the, the task of bringing along the next generation. So beneath them, they're, they're actively recruiting, trying to be very engaged uh, in the, the industry from a supply chain standpoint. Um, and we're really seeing success in that because I think uh, a lot of women are feeling comfortable saying, I don't need to go do a stint in supply chain. I can build my career in supply chain. There's enough here. Uh, there's enough growth opportunities. Uh, there's enough um, innovation in supply chain that I can really learn and grow. Uh, my second anecdote is that, uh, and I, some people here may know the organization, and if not, I encourage you to, particularly if, in, if you're in Europe, but there is the uh, lead organization, and it's leading executives in advancing diversity, and it's really made up of CPG and retail organizations, so uh, your Carrefour, your Migros, Turk, uh, Unilever, Coca-Cola, um, other companies, and uh, several years ago, they started a supply chain um, kind of support group almost for women in supply chain. And literally when that started, it was about four or five people. Uh, and they would get together and connect to try to help each other. And that has now grown to 30 or 40 and it's really having an impact. And so I like to use that as a proof point that there's momentum here and that um, more women are choosing to make uh, supply chain uh, a, a career and a great opportunity for them to learn and grow. And I think the more and more integrated it becomes to the business, the more uh, varied and diverse skill sets that it requires, the better it will be uh, to just bring in more people with, uh, with more backgrounds, both, both if it's women, men, you know, just bring diversity into it and, and you're really seeing some great things happen from that, so. Awesome, that's very encouraging to hear. Um, let's talk a little bit about the pandemic. Um, so as a chief executive responsible for the commercial strategies, can you share some of the major challenges you have faced during the pandemic, both personally and for your company? How was Viaggio impacted and how were your distributors and stakeholders and supply chain impacted? Yeah. Definitely, well, like everyone else, uh, we were impacted and, and I'd say, you know, with Viaggio, uh, it's been um, very varied across our system. So you have markets like the U.S. Um, where the business uh, on the retail off-premise side just really took off exponentially. Uh, you have other markets, whether that's India or South Africa, Kenya, um, that were completely shut to any spirits uh, or alcohol sales. We have markets that are beer led that are heavily on on premise um, oriented from a channel mix and those were really impacted so we had some markets australia us just booming um and then other markets where we we were prohibited from selling anything uh, so that was a very interesting thing to work through really required a market by market approach um, and our supply chain team worked really closely to move inventory. So the U.S. was out of stock and India had too much and some of it's not the, the same products, but they really worked to try to, to find all those opportunities of where could we shift things from, you know, one market to another. Uh, how could we um, really, you know, leverage it as best as possible. So um, that was one area. And then I'd say we early on identified that not only in the short term, but in the longer term, this was going to have an impact on us in three areas. Uh, the first was really how we work. So this was all about a quick shift to, you know, not making physical sales calls, but making virtual sales calls. Uh, having um, the teams that used to sit and look at where's inventory, what are, what's our forecasting, what is our supply orders, um, had to shift that to uh, being much more dynamic because one day something was closed and the next day it was open and then it was closed again uh, and had to re like really change the routines um, that we did there. Uh, we had to change how we sell. So we had to get much more where we could be flexible. It was no longer a, a set route of customers on a day, um, you know, shifting it to virtual sales calls leveraging technology to allow our customers to order 24 seven um, through, uh, you know, uh, an e-commerce type site. Um, and then the last area that we know is really changing, and, and this is to your question, is all around our route to market. So 
we know that uh, there will be, you know, we've got a lot of markets where we work with uh, multiple wholesalers and distributors uh, as our primary um, path to uh, our customers. And um, we're seeing, you know, Im huge impact there, seeing channel shift with on trade closing. Uh, you're seeing people uh, struggle uh, to stay in business and some of the big getting bigger and the small getting smaller. Also local and smaller providers in some cases doing very well. So that real dynamic shift in the supply chain and our route to market. Um, and we've, we've stepped back and said, let's take a couple year horizon on this and recognize that this actually gives us a unique moment in time to say, are we fit for purpose for the future? Um, you know, we're, we're a company that does, you know, might be only around as an entity, you know, 20, 20 plus years, but we've got brands that Johnny Walker just was 200 years old. So we've got a lot of legacy supply chain out there. Um, a lot of legacy, how we go to market. And we've really said, let's, let's not waste this crisis and look at it to say, how do we leapfrog um, and really set up a fit for purpose supply chain and a route to consumer that may look very different from today. And uh, um, we're doing that work uh, now in, in many of our markets, which is exciting. And uh, uh, that's where really, you know, putting supply chain becomes much more front and center than it used to be. Awesome. I just want to build off on a couple of things you said. Um, so let's take a little bit into how these challenges you mentioned, whether it could be related to work, you know, the way you're changing the selling channels. Um, uh, how did these challenges shape Diageo strategies? What do you see changing about Diageo supply chain strategies that has been accelerated or altered as a result of the pandemic? What would look different going forward and do you see increasing investments related to digital transformations or, you know, uh, uh, data analytics or emerging technologies in general? Yeah, definitely. So uh, we did a presentation to our board really focused on those kind of three trends that I mentioned. And, and well, what I'd say is that while we had plans to do these things, the, the current situation, the pandemic has really accelerated the need to and given the catalyst uh, to really prove out that we've got to do it now and, and we don't have the luxury of doing this over the next three to five years, we've got to do it now. So um, we've embarked on a huge digitization of our supply chain. Um, you know, we, we had a uh, very, I wouldn't say antiquated, but very, and because it, it worked well, but it would have been very manual supply chain. Um, you know, in, in certain cases, we would air freight and ship overnight product to places to cover it. Um, we didn't have full visibility uh, through any kind of tool where we could each look and see where inventory was throughout our system. Where was it moving, you know, with all of our whiskey, Scotch whiskeys being made in Scotland. Um, couldn't see when they, where they were, when they were arriving, and we didn't have one picture of the truth. So. Um, in a very short time, we've really reworked that, rolling out a great tool uh, in the markets that it's uh, gone into. We can already see the impact, um, but it just gives us that, that visibility of the inventory real time. It lets everybody see the same version of the truth. So if you're in sales and you're waiting to have to have a discussion with your customers about where your product is and your inventory, you're seeing the same thing as the supply chain who sent it out is and who's ordering. Um, as well as uh, our commercial finance team so that they know where those investments and costs are. So uh, big investment there. Uh, we've also made a, a large investment in um, the, the how we sell piece. So really digitizing our Salesforce. Uh, we had um, done a lot with Salesforce uh, automation already, but this has really driven the need uh, to do it quicker, faster, get more markets on board because we see markets where we had rolled this out were much easier to, to pivot and adapt to the new environment. And we're seeing uh, a dramatic difference in performance in general between those markets, um, both in efficiencies and effectiveness and growth. So uh, we're continuing um, that investment. So I'd say it's really accelerated what we're doing versus um, you know changed. Um, so we were pleased that we felt we had the right strategies in place. We were just way too slow. So this is, as really said, we've got to, we've got to do this quickly. Um, and then on the things that didn't require investment is really changing a lot of the processes. So, um, from a supply chain standpoint, supply chain now has seats at the table with our customer discussions. Um, they have, 
you know, in the US where we have control states, which means, you know, the government basically is your customer. Um, we actually have supply chains sitting in the meetings so that the salesperson supply chain and the customer can understand where inventory is, what's coming in, you know, are we going to be short on Don Julio tequila because there's such demand and it'll be showing up in two days instead of a salesperson just saying, I have no idea. Um, so really changing those processes uh, has been very, very helpful and, and not cost any money. That's just been a change in how we do things. Awesome. Just curious. Uh, so are you considering as the Agio strategy uh, pursuing any supply based shifts or is it, uh, are you okay with the current uh, way that it is set up? On, the, on what? I missed the, the part. Supply based shifts. Uh, we are, um, we are taking a look at all aspects uh, and knowing that we need to really, um, I'd say, modernize and move from being what was an efficient and effective supply chain that worked adequately to being a very modern, um, you know, supply chain. Uh, we recognize that it's no longer going to be as simple as, you know, you go to a liquor store or a grocery store or a bar. Uh, that there's going to be all these other uh, digital channels and intermediaries and wholesalers and different uh, brands. So, you know, we're really trying to, to start with what does it look like in three years, five years, 10 years out, and then make those decisions backwards. So we're testing a lot of different things um, it, with the whole plan of we've got to just uh, continue to drive the digitization. And, and, you know, the things we've done so far, we're really seeing um, and that's been primarily right now that's really out in the market, fully rolled out is that um, the the transparency of the inventory using some really great digital tools. Awesome, great to hear that, Jim. Um, so one of the elements you mentioned is uh, about how the working models have shifted, right? And I've read about that you opened a new US headquarters in um, New York as just the pandemic hit. So how did you navigate the overnight work from home change? Ah, yes. Yeah. So um, we built a beautiful office. I'm very, uh, I'm very excited to try to get back into it. Uh, three World Trade Center right above the monument and the memorial uh, and moved from a longtime office in, in Norwalk, Connecticut. So everybody got a, a couple of weeks of being there. Uh, was really great for um, connections and morale and energy. Uh, and then overnight that, you know, flipped off um, as it did in our London office and our other major hub offices. And um, Diageo being a very social organization, that connection and collaboration was very, very important. Um, so we really, um, you know, outside of some of the policies of uh, working from home, we've really embarked on a um, how to make people connected. Uh, how do you um, leverage the tools? Um, one of the things we did immediately was really uh, try to train people on um, how to use a lot of the tools. So imagine you're a salesperson and then suddenly, you, you, you know, everything you do changed and you've been doing it that way for 15 years. Um, we, we really quickly, and this was led um, by some of the team members uh, on my group, uh, rolled out, you know, how to work from home, how to do an effective um, verbal call, how to uh, do a um, non-physical sales calls. Um, what what's effective on that? What's different about it? What's the same? And and really got a lot of that training, uh, built resources uh, out to people. And I think um, you know we saw um, and we learned also from China. So early on, we had our China team um, get on a Zoom. We had over 700 and something people that got on it just to hear their experiences and what they'd learned. Uh, so we were able to really leverage the globalness of our system to learn from each other. Um, and then we've continued that cadence. So we literally uh, on three days, three, four days a week, we do a um, very quick Yammer post. So almost like a tweet uh, that goes out with a best practice and a learning um, from our markets. And we started off, it was very COVID focused, how to work from home, what are people doing? Um, how are we managing through closures and opening and the dynamic environment? And now it's really gotten into how are people, you know, growing? How are people, what are they learning? How's work happening? And um, I think everybody's pretty, pretty used to now seamlessly working from uh, home and pretty surprised that it works as well as it does. Awesome. Um, and, you know, just a continuation to that, uh, one of the effects of the pandemic as we all are still get, uh, getting adjusted to work from home as uh, people can feel isolated and fatigued. 
and Diageo being such a strong social organization, uh, how do you keep your teams motivated and productive and how do you keep that social element still alive? Yeah, so um, we are a very social uh, organization and uh, a couple of things, uh, like anybody, we've been doing um, some Zoom happy hours and, uh, and we've really been leveraging some of our assets, uh, whether in, in themed type uh, uh, interactions. So um, if we have brand ambassadors, so whether that's David Beckham or Ryan Reynolds, uh, who's Aviation Gin and David Beckham um, represents uh, our Hague Club. Uh, getting them on, um, using them to engage employees. Um, we've used um, some of our uh, bartender ambassadors to actually teach people how to make cocktails. We'll have a theme each month um, around what that looks like. And so there's always something um, going on that's, uh, I'd say, big and broad and then inside people's own teams, really, really leveraging um, what that looks like. Uh, for our uh, our holiday party for my group, we actually played a version of Family Feud, uh, which if you ever know, it's the one with the big strikes and you try to, to get it, um, a, a holiday version of that. And, and um, you know, just tried to find it. We had uh, costume contests and we do different theme things uh, for our meetings to just try keep people engaged. Uh, we also recognize that it's very stressful, uh, monotonous on people uh, and have um, known that the, the everybody's got to have the flexibility to do what works for them. So we've really instituted flex hours. My group's global where, you know, if you look at my, my direct team, um, not the 6,000, but the smaller corporate team, uh, you know, based in 15 different countries. So um, we're just very flexible about finding uh, the, the time um, to work that works best for everyone. So uh, we're, we let people figure that out themselves. Um, and as long as the work is getting done, I don't care, you know, what times they work. Uh, just, and as long as, you know, if they need to be part of a collaborative team, that they're part of that. Um, but otherwise, really encouraging people to find what works for them. Um, we did a all day, a, volu a virtual volunteer day. Uh, uh, my assistant got shirts for everybody, shipped them around the world. We all wore our shirts. Uh, everybody chose an activity they wanted to do in their community, whether it was picking up trash, um, or uh, some people went and helped their elderly, elderly neighbors or took dogs for walks. Um, and then we all got back on and shared. And, and that was a really fulfilling, great day uh, that I think re-energized uh, all of us. I know it did me. Awesome. Perfect. And one last question for us to uh, end this conversation. So in, in one of your recent posts, Julia, I've read uh, uh, in House of Rose Professional, you shared your personal principles and strategies. And I quote here, reaching down, reaching out, lifting as you climb. Um, so could you talk a little bit about it and what advice do you have for our audience here and women is aspiring to make it to the top of the organization? Yeah, so I like to look at it that um, the, the way I see it, we each have our, our career in our own hands, right? Um, because with your hand, you can reach down. Um, and I think it's, a, it's um, something we each should do, which is to bring those along who are coming behind you and to make that impact. So I'm a big believer that you do that, it will help your career. Um, the more you surround yourself with people who can replace you, the more you're your, um, the people around you feel comfortable moving you to something new. So really reaching down and bringing those uh, behind you um, up and forward as well. Then reaching across, um, because I'm a big believer that so much happens from relationships. The more people that you connect with, the more people um, you're able to build um, a relationship with, the more you'll learn. You never know where those contacts are going to take you or where those interactions will take you, but you'll always learn something and you'll always be better for it. So um, that broad base reaching across to people and then uh, reaching up and that's, you know, you're never going to break the ceiling if you don't raise your hand and try to touch the sky because um, it's people will sometimes you have the, the thought that you need to wait and somebody will come and tap you. Um, but raising your hand says, I'm ready, I want to do more, I want to learn, I want to try, I'm interested in this. And sometimes women in particular were very um, shy or were reticent about doing that and raising our hands. And so I think it's really, really important uh, to raise your hand and volunteer for a stretch assignment, 
volunteer to try something new, um, volunteer to say, I'm here and I'm ready or I'm interested in that, how do I get there? Um, and so that's, a, that's the way I look at it where it's all in your hands because you can reach down and pull those people up. You can reach across and, and build great relationships and then don't be afraid to raise your hand to say, I want to learn more. Uh, I want to try this uh, and, and hey, I'm here and don't forget um, that I could be great at that. That's awesome. Um... That's, uh, that's amazing uh, tips uh, from you, Julie. I personally enjoyed this conversation and I guess we are getting to the end of the session. We are at the top of the hour. So I personally have a lot of uh, takeaways and uh, I'm sure our audience are feeling the same way. So thank you once again, all of you for participating in this amazing uh, chat. Uh, we're gonna have another discussion much like this. So stay tuned and Julie, thank you very much once again for your Great. time. In, and in, in the chat, I will, uh, I'll just leave um, my email. So if anybody wants to connect, has any questions, uh, you also wanna know anything about our great brands, I'm happy to, to help with that. So uh, um, I'll put that into the chat for everyone in events, uh, anyone wants to reach out and, and continue uh, the conversation uh, and just uh, hope everybody has a great day and uh, stay healthy. And um, if you're, uh, you're going to be uh, enjoying a product this weekend. We've got some for you. So, yeah. Cheers to all. Great. Of us. Thanks so much for having me.